welcome to Tuesday News Day, your number one resource for the entire week's worth of VR news. We did it, fam. We're out here on a Tuesday. Future thrill here. I, I just checked. Still working on this video, and it's uh, Wednesday. So, yeah. Anyways, today is a refreshing day for the VR space. Ready Player One-esque VR gloves, some ridiculously cool glove prototypes from Meta that are honestly the kind of gloves that you've been waiting for, teeny tiny VR headsets, and finally, more information on the Half Dive, a self-proclaimed Sword Art Online-inspired VR device that totally flips VR conventions on their head. That and so much more, let's just get right into the news. So, starting out, last week I mentioned some massive improvements coming to the Quest 2 that will significantly improve performance. This was mainly application space warp, an improved space warp technology that allows the Quest to only render half of the frames needed. And intelligent software fills in the rest of the frames with synthetic frames, enabling as much as 70% more performance headroom, which is crazy. Well, that feature has launched this week, so we can expect to see it coming to games and applications as soon as developers implement it. In a perfect world, nobody will notice any visual difference, except maybe higher frame rates and better visuals. But but we'll have to see if that's actually the case as games start to roll out with it. Usual space warp artifacts uh, don't look so good, but Oculus does say that this new technology is better. So I've been really into tiny VR headsets lately. Right now I'm working on a few videos with the Arpara 5K, a super small and light headset, and also a video using the Huawei Micro OLED glasses and throwing a vibe tracker on to see just how small I can get a VR headset. Things just keep getting smaller, and I'm down for it. This is a VR glasses prototype from EM. M3, codenamed the Ether. Weighing less than 35 grams and only 6.8 millimeters thick, the glasses are stated to contain a micro OLED display with a resolution of 2500 by 2500 per eye and have a field of view of 90 degrees. Really not that far for most current big headsets, and the company has already stated that the next iteration will have a wider field of view of 110 degrees. And to get into the nitty gritty, the more interesting part here is how these things even work. Nearly all headsets use a lens system that you peer through similar to something like binoculars, or really not all that different in principle from normal glasses. But the Ether uses a completely different technology that allows for this extremely small form factor. Using something called Neo-M, an optic imaging system, small diffractive lenses converge all visible light within a short focal length to a single point, essentially doing the same thing as a typical lens does, but way smaller. Of course, there are still problems with diffractive lenses, and they're definitely not perfect, and this is just a prototype, but we're watching VR get smaller smaller and smaller as VR gets bigger. So I'm about to talk about VR gloves, but as I'm writing this video, I see a new tweet from Andrew Bosworth of Meta using a set of prototype VR glasses with a quest, with the quote, bringing touch and sensation to the metaverse will unlock an even greater sense of presence, but achieving this demands numerous advances in technology. Gloves are coming. It's not going to be easy, and there are so many things that have to be innovated upon and done right for things to work well, but this paper that was literally just posted it goes over everything, and it's remarkably interesting. Reality Labs talks about how important it is to get everything right and in sync, to have a total system between gloves, headset hardware, and software to make any sort of haptic and control system convincing and immersive. Initially, the question was asked by the Reality Labs team, quote, can we build a mass-producible, affordable consumer device that lets people experience any tangible interface anywhere? We couldn't do it. End quote. And this is why they're doing so much research. They're actually creating entirely new materials and ways to let people feel and interact with any virtual world, VR or AR. I think one of the most interesting points here was the paper's take on perception of touch and interaction. The goal isn't necessarily to create a one-to-one -one exact feeling with physical objects and virtual ones. If, for example, you're holding an orange in VR, it doesn't have to feel exactly like a physical orange. Instead, if software and hardware and visuals all work together as intended in sync, the brain can connect the dots and allow you to feel things in a sort of totally different way. A simple way to put this is, it's not that virtual objects don't or can't feel real, it's that virtual reality may just feel different. Right now, Reality Labs is working on electrostimulation, tiny flexible actuators, all sorts of vibration motors, new materials, tiny tiny threads, but of course, it's not consumer ready and it's probably going to be wild to get anything from them. But I'm definitely looking forward to where all of this research 
research leads us. And I'll say it again, gloves are coming and will come. But let's take a step back from prototypes for a hot minute and talk about the now and staying on the topic of gloves. If there's one thing over the past few years that I have really wanted to be nailed down for VR, even in its rudimentary form, not as advanced as what Meta is researching is what I'm trying to say, it is still VR gloves. Look, controllers are fine and they have their place for many things. It's still the easiest way to get button input and to accomplish locomotion. However, I don't know about you, but I've always imagined a world where we transition to using gloves for everything in VR. Of course, games would have to be designed around that to no longer utilize raw button inputs, but the increase in immersion would be fantastic, especially if these gloves had any sort of haptics. So far though, I have tested gloves, even built VR gloves, but nothing quite hits that easy to use and easily available point. But I have recently caught wind of a company, Senso, that has a set of pretty decent looking Steam VR compatible gloves that work with just about everything, and like I said, they are Steam VR compatible right out of the box. I don't have any experience with them uh, on hand, and the videos showing the device in testing are pretty terrible with the gestures all being out of sync with the gameplay, but this is something I definitely want to try and make a video on for sure. And in case you're wondering how menus and buttons are interacted with since you don't have any buttons, everything is all gesture-based using various hand signs to open menus or do things in games or to signal a button press. Plus, there is haptic feedback with six vibration motors so you can feel the games as well. I also found that this company has something called the Senso Suit, which is a Steam VR full body tracked haptic setup for your whole body so you can have mocap, haptics, gloves, all within the same ecosystem. The only problem though is the Senso gloves are not cheap at all. The gloves costing a whopping thousand dollars per pair, which better be darn good and better than this video shows if they do cost a grand, but it's still cool. And I do like how Senso markets that the gloves do work for consumers and their games and applications as well as for commercial applications. Almost every other glove venture just skips right over anything consumer, so this is really welcomed. Hopefully, as more and more companies get into the glove space in VR, we can eventually drop the controllers, at least for some things. And we're about to talk about the half dive, but now it's time for a me break! Look at this guy's like $7,000 monitor setup. I mean, it's cool and all, and I have one of these monitors and I love it, but at this point, it's a legitimate Look what they need to mimic a fraction of our power. At that price, you could just get a Vario or something, and it'd probably look even better with more screen real estate. Uh, but uh, well, back to the news. So let's finally talk about the half dive. I don't think I've ever been sent a topic so many times over the past few months as I have been sent the half dive. I covered it way back when it was first announced, but there's been quite a bit more information on it since, and it's really interesting. If you've never heard of it, this is a headset that by the creator's words was directly influenced by Sword Art Online. Well, probably except for the dying part, which is apparent in the name, Half Dive. And it's interesting because the device is a completely different take on virtual reality. Instead of the traditional headset on the head and moving around, the Half Dive is a nearly completely stationary device by Tokyo-based company DiverX. And some of you automatically would think, why would I want to play VR laying down? Isn't the point of VR to get up and move around like you're in the game? But I think you're asking the wrong question. Instead of why would you do this, I'd ask, why why do this in general and what does it offer? And that's where the half dive gets interesting. VR is completely tied down by keeping devices as small and light as possible, which is good, but there's a lot of technology that could be utilized, it's just too heavy and cumbersome to have on a face. So they decided to make the headset stationary and take your face to the headset. The company calls this a 4.5 degree of freedom headset. Instead of moving your entire body, foot sensors are used to detect small changes in the angle of rotation of the ankle. So you just slightly pedal your feet to walk. Full hand controllers will be used and they look pretty similar to the Valve Index controllers in most ways, but the real meat of the half dive comes to what they've squeezed into the package that doesn't move. A full surround sound speaker setup, a wind simulator using fans, vibration feedback and haptics, and a wire resistance system so you can grab objects or you can be stopped whenever there are virtual objects. Your arms will just be held back simulating an actual object being in the space. The lens system and optics are also interesting. Using a pretty low resolution of 1600 by 1440 per eye, which is pretty low considering they could have used nearly any displays regardless of weight here, but the field of view is
is at 134 degrees. The next magic is a varifocal lens setup, using a variety of lenses and lens types to make the image as clear as possible, which may make up entirely for the lower resolution. And I guess one good thing about the lower res is it makes powering the half dive out of a computer a little easier. This will go live on Kickstarter just next month, and warning, it's not cheap, starting at $700 for the base version without the varifocal lenses, and ranging all the way up to $4,000 for the fully kitted bundle with those varifocals. I don't know, seems really cool. Maybe if I get like, I don't know, a lot of engagement here, I'd be interested in picking one up if there is interest. So let me know, I guess. And this is a pretty decent chunk of change, but I see where they're going for it, and I think it's cool. And this might seem weird to some people if you're completely out of the know of VR chat or social VR culture, but I actually have slept in VR quite a bit, and I still do relatively consistently. So maybe having a headset that does that really well isn't such a bad idea because I know I'm not the only one. And DiverX says something pretty awesome here. They're utilizing the sleep position to, quote, enable human activity in its lowest energy state, end quote. The Vive Focus 3 just got a pretty big update over the air, bringing co-locomotion, larger play spaces, and most interestingly, Wi-Fi 6E support, which it had all along. HTC just didn't mention it for certification reasons. So along with this, supported play spaces have been expanded to more than 30 meters. You can have a co-play space where other people can see Focus 3 users in the same space as you, which would be useful for joint in-person VR things like arcades or work. And Wi-Fi 6E is now supported, bringing all of the insane benefits of 6E. Linus has a great video on what Wi-Fi 6E does if you don't know what it brings, and it's actually pretty game-changing, especially for VR stuff. 6E full support isn't quite coming yet, as it has to go through the slow rollout from regulators from other countries, but it was a pleasant surprise to get support or even announce support for it at all. Also, I actually have a Focus 3, and maybe I'll make a full video on it and review it if you'd like. Just let me know again. And now it's time for question of the week from Sean. Question related to the Enreal, which are AR glasses. Is the FOV really usable? It seems like it would really limit the experience as things cut off mid-vision, which would also limit the applications you can use these for. And yeah, the FOV is pretty limited and it's more annoying than anything. Anything within the FOV is awesome, but having your augmented reality be cut off into a square in front of you is really weird. I do find it usable still, I just have to work around that, and it still wows a lot of people every time I put the glasses on. But FOV is the biggest improvement I'm looking for in glasses in the future. And that's question of the week. Make sure you leave your own below, I may just answer yours next. And I just did a whole new Discord server revamp, so come on in and check out all the new stuff, new colors, new staff, new look, and also come in to meet some new VR people. Thank you to all of my Patreon supporters, especially my Omegas. I couldn't do any of this without you. And don't forget to like this video if you loved it, subscribe if you want more of this, and hit that freaking bell if you just can't live without it. Much love, roll out.